George McEnany is someone who I had um, been that vaguely dimly aware of as a uh, student of planning, um, but uh, it wasn't until I met um, Anthony C. Wood of the New York Preservation Archive Project who suggested that perhaps he was someone who ought to be dredged up out of history and, and, and made more prominent in the city today that I really started to take a look. And, um, uh, and I have to thank um, uh, 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 Tony for, for, for suggesting this because the more I've investigated George McEnany, the more I learn about uh, the, uh, the history of New York City and uh, the, the, the shaping of New York City. So often we in this city take much of its physical built environment as a given, as something that just existed, but in fact, um, it was shaped consciously by people like McEnany um, in the past, just as um, our civic leaders today are trying to shape it in, in one way or another. Um, and so um, I, I want to talk about uh, uh, McEnany's role in developing the Civic Center and how it, but, but really also to put it in the context of how it fits into the uh, city's, the, the transformation of the city from old New York uh, of the 19th century to the metropolis that we inhabit today. Um, so, uh, if you were a uh, voter in New York County uh, in 1909, you might have received a very official looking summons like this, apparently from the New York County Supreme Court um, uh, in the matter of George McEnany, plaintiff versus the Tammany Grafters, defendant. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, and, and urging you to, uh, summoning you actually, not urging you, summoning you to your, vote, to your, polling, pla uh, your polling place to vote for George McEnany for the president of the borough of Manhattan. Um, so, so, so McEnany is, a, uh, uh, casting, is cast as a, a, a progressive reformer um, who is uh, gonna take on the Tammany Hall machine. Um, now, in this, so this is in 1909. Um, in 1898, New York City, of course, was merged with Brooklyn, Queens, um, parts of the Bronx that weren't already part of it, and Staten Island. Um, since, 18, since, that, uh, since then, or, or from 1898 to, um, to 1909, most of the time, the government was controlled by Tammany Hall politicians. Um, and there was a real sense that, that uh, the city was, it was, was unfocused, and that, and that it wasn't fulfilling the potential that it had as a, as a great merged metropolis. Um, the budget was growing every year. Um, by 1909, it was equal to one-fourth of the entire federal budget. Um, uh, there was a lot of uh, waste and inefficiency that reformers saw in, in, in the government. The streets were gridlocked. The rapid transit was inadequate. Sounds familiar. Um, uh, tenements were spreading from the central parts of the old city and the old parts of Brooklyn into the newer parts of, 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 of the newer de developing areas in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. And, um, so there was a sense that the, that the city needed, needed some leadership and needed some, some new leadership. And um, uh, the, the, the borough president of Manhattan at that time was a man named John Ahern, um, who uh, was investigated by the city club, which was a, a civic organization of reformers and, and do-gooders and people who wanted to, to, to uh, modernize the city government, which George McEnany was the president of at this time. And they, uh, they did an investigation, brought a list of charges um, to the governor, um, asking the governor to, asking uh, Governor Charles Evans Hughes to remove um, the borough president from office, um, which uh, the governor then did so. Um, and uh, on the grounds that he was incompetent and had not fixed the potholes of, of the city streets. <laughs> and uh, uh, really one of the few times that anybody's ever been removed from office for incompetence. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, 10 days after, governor, after the governor removed him, uh, the Tammany Hall Control Board of Aldermen, um, which is the predecessor of today's city council, um, put him right back into office for the rest of his term. So it was, it was, it was obvious that this was going to have to be dealt with at the next election. Um, now, why do we even care about the borough president of Manhattan? Um, at, at, that time, at that time, borough presidents had a lot more power than they do now. They, they had control over the streets and public works in their boroughs. They controlled individual borough building departments that regulated buildings. Um, and they also had a vote on the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, which was a, a kind of like an executive council for the city. That, that lasted until the 1980s, actually. Um, and uh, so they could actually uh, outvote the mayor. Um, and, and so in some sense, um, uh, these borough presidents had mayoral-like powers at that time. So uh, 
Uh, the Republican Party actually in 1909 agreed to be the, the vehicle for a slate of, uh, a fusion slate of candidates, both Republicans and Democrats. Um, George McEnany was actually a Democrat, but not a, not a Tammany Democrat. This slate, um, almost all of them won, big time. And um, George McEnany, who's, who's on the left there, um, of, of this uh, picture on the grandstand, um, um, now finds himself, along with the other reformers, in power. Um, no longer sniping from the sidelines, but actually um, in, in the seat of power. So um, just a little more about, a little about George McEnany before I, I uh, get into some of the things that he did um, and, and his role in the Civic Center. Um, uh, he, before he, had, uh, uh, he was elected, as I mentioned, he was uh, the president of the City Club. Before that, he worked for this gentleman, Edward Morse Shepherd, who was a very prominent attorney, had run for mayor himself in 1902 and lost, but Edward Shepard had a, had a large law practice and one of his clients was the Pennsylvania Railroad, which was at that time seeking to build Penn Station and a huge network of connecting rail lines, including the tunnels under the Hudson River um, and, 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 and some other lines in, in the other boroughs that would make it uh, a, a central station for New York. And they needed permission from the state in order to, to build this. So George McEnany, although he was not himself an attorney, um, had, who had, had, had been a, uh, uh, an advocate for, for many years of, uh, of reform laws in Albany and had worked as, uh, for, for a variety of organizations on civil service reform, had connections in Albany with legislatures, with legislators, was hired by Shepard to go to Albany week after week to lobby for, this, uh, for his client. Um, and McEnany even thought that perhaps he would sit for the bar himself and become a lawyer. In those days, you could do that without going to law school, um, but uh, and that never, never did. But, uh, uh, but, but this was his sort of his, his introduction to physical planning, actually, was, was working on this, this giant project with, for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, now, McEnany also had, had, had a reputation of being, as being someone of character, someone with, uh, uh, it was said, a spotless honesty, who lives a correct life and would finally, after um, Tammany, uh, uh, after, after sort of Tammany decadence for many years, would, would lend dignity uh, to the office of borough president. Um, he, he, was, uh, he was a family man. He was married and had a number of children by this point. Uh, his father died when he was 22, and he also took responsibility for his younger siblings. Now, his wife, Marjorie, uh, was the uh, daughter of Abraham Jacoby and Mary Putnam Jacoby. And you can see Abraham Jacoby on the right here in this photo. Uh, so uh, the Jacobys were the most prominent pediatricians and probably the most pro prominent physicians of any kind in, in New York City in the, in the late 19th century. And, uh, McEnany uh, himself uh, came from a sort of a middle class background and actually from, from New Jersey originally and, and, and didn't have a lot of money himself, but the, but the Jacobis had some money. And, uh, the, 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 and, and the Jacobis built for the McEnany's this, this house on Lake George uh, where, they, where they would summer. And this is a house that's, that, that still exists. Um, and I have to thank uh, John Warner, by the way, for uh, this photograph. Um, and, and, and for introducing me to some of the uh, uh, McEnany's uh, uh, life up at, up at Lake George, which he is, he is personally acquainted with. Um, but the, the, but the Mac so the McEnany's summered at Lake George along with the Jacobis, along with Carl Schertz, who was another uh, of very close associate of George McEnany, who he'd worked with earlier, um, um, as did Edward Shepard, by the way. And so they were, they were part of a community of a civic elite that uh, lived in New York City, summered together up at the lake, um, was connected through their through philanthropic endeavors to super rich folks like uh, the Carnegies and the Rockefellers, and uh, supported uh, uh, supported civic institutions both in New York City and nationally. So George McEnany. Uh, was on the boards, for example, of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, the Hampton Institute in Virginia, um, uh, uh, African-American um, institutions of higher education. He was a personal friend of Booker T. Washington um, and, and, and helped uh, uh, Washington uh, go on a lecture tour around, uh, around the country. 
um, and, and brought him into New York, into the City Club, which prompted actually some members to resign because they didn't want, uh, they, they, they didn't think that was appropriate. So, so, uh, uh, he, so, so McEnany was connected to this sort of this conservative, sort of a conservative wing, not the Marcus Garveys of the world, of course, but, but sort of the conservative wing of the um, uh, 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 social and, and uh, uh, civic reform movements. Um, and uh, so uh, as sort of a member of, a, of, of an elite, um, he and, and the other reformers, uh, once they were in office, they, they felt that they had a uh, kind of a right to rule, that they knew what was best. It was almost like a paternalistic attitude that they had. Um, so occasionally he got into trouble. He, he, one of the first things he set out to do was to widen streets throughout Manhattan because to, to deal with the traffic problems um, and, and to try to accommodate business. Um, and the, the newspapers took advantage of this by saying that he's writing roughshod over, over, the, neighbors, over the neighborhoods. It did actually spark some neighborhood opposition um, uh, to, to, to these plans. Um, uh, which uh, would only grow uh, in, in later years. But uh, uh, what, it, what he was really trying to do was to, to modernize the administration of the city to, uh, uh, and, and to modernize the physical landscape of the city itself. Um, he, he wanted to, his, his ideology was one of modernization, but it was also one of getting things done. And uh, he said, we have cities to build, we have charters to write, we have great public works, to be fashioned for the benefit of city and state, we have social problems to solve. So all of these things were what he was going to try to do in office. Now, what did he do with, in, now, now, now let's, let's turn to his role in the Civic Center. So um, uh, this is a sort of a contemporary photo of the Civic Center. You've already seen some images that look kind of like this. Uh, the state legislature, almost as soon as George McEnany took office, uh, proposed to replace Tweed Courthouse, which is this building to the rear of City Hall here, with, uh, with a much new and much larger building. Um, and George McEnany initially uh, agreed with this idea. Uh, the mayor, William Gaynor, appointed a courthouse board with McEnany as the chairman to evaluate this site against other possible sites. So they went out and took a look around and they, and they came back a few months later and said, well, we already own the land here. Um, this would be the e easiest place to build it. It's logical, let's just, let's just build the courthouse on, on, on the existing site. Nobody likes that Tweed courthouse anyway. And uh, uh, that sparked a huge uproar of, of, uh, uh, of objections. So um, a number of groups, including the City Club, which, which George McEnany had previously been the president of, as I mentioned, um, along with um, architects and artists, uh, 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 start, uh, sponsored a campaign to save City Hall and the City Hall Park from this new courthouse. Now, now, they didn't care about the Tweed Courthouse either. Of course, it's landmarked now, but in those days, they, 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 nobody would have thought of landmarking that building um, because of its associations with Tammany. But they did care very much about City Hall. And uh, they, uh, you've seen this image before that, that, uh, that, uh, that Bob showed. They created this image to show you the, how much this new building would dominate City Hall, that it would completely envelop it. And what they suggested instead was that let's clear out City Hall Park um, and move, if you're gonna, we, we, we do need a new courthouse, but let's put it on the north side of Chambers Street um, where, where there's a parking lot and, and some other older buildings now. Um, and instead, let's, let's tear down Tweed Courthouse and let's open up City Hall Park and let, let City Hall uh, sit alone as a jewel in the jewel box of City Hall Park. Um, <clears throat> So uh, uh, George McEnany was the chairman of the courthouse board, as I mentioned, um, which uh, then responded to this criticism by saying, all right, let's, we'll take another look. Um, and the state legislature kind of gave them an, a six months ultimatum and said, you've got to decide where you're going to move it or we're going to force you to build it in the park. And so uh, McEnany persuaded, the, well, McEnany worked with the courthouse board to, to, to broker an agreement to choose a new site that was going to be downhill a few blocks from the existing site, where, of course, 60 Center uh, Street is now. Um, and they, uh, this is one of the plans. That, there were a number of plans that were proposed for this. Um, Bob and, and, and John both showed you other, other diagrams. But um, this, this kind of zooms in on it, and it shows you what, what, they, what they wanted to do. They wanted to acquire not only the site um, for the courthouse itself, that round building, but also a number of the adjoining uh, properties. And uh, to, the, uh, to the northeast here, uh, 
they suggested building a boulevard up to the uh, up to the Manhattan Bridge. So this was going to be a trend. So 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 the idea was that rather than just building a new courthouse, you're going to build you're going to start to build a civic center, and you're going to acquire even more land than you need in part to try to raise the real estate values of that area. So uh, the uh, so the idea was actually the city would actually recoup some of its costs by buying up land that, at, at a low value, building improvements that would then raise the values of, of, of the area and then sell it back to developers, um, uh, what we now probably would call value capture. And uh, so um, uh, this proceeded kind of slowly. Um, in the meantime, McEnany went ahead and cleaned up the Tweed Courthouse, um, almost dazzling the lawyers and judges just with water, paint, and disinfectant. And that's what they were going to have to be satisfied with for a while. Uh, so uh, as, as the courthouse board prepared ever more elaborate plans um, for um, not only a new courthouse in this area, but also uh, 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 feder federal courts, a state office building, parking lots. Um, and, and this, of course, is the plan that would, uh, the, 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 the New York Times approved of as uh, 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 having very great advantages, as particularly in that it would remove from the face of the earth Chinatown and all of its neighboring tenement houses. Um, so, so this was a plan really to, John mentioned the real estate values. Again, this was a plan to raise real estate values. This was, this was a plan to fundamentally transform this area that was just down, down, the, hall, down, down the street from, uh, from City Hall. So uh, the city started acquiring land for this. Um, objections were immediately raised from real estate interests that didn't like the idea of the city competing with private landlords um, uh, uh, to buy up land. The federal government and the state government weren't being cooperative, um, and, and it, it became obvious that there was no way that they were going to be able to, 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 to implement this, this entire scheme. Um, so it took a number of years. By 1926, finally, the uh, 60 Center Street was built, um, and, and Foley Square, as it now uh, exists, um, um, came into being. Um, and, and eventually, the federal government and the state government did put their uh, courthouses and office buildings in this area. So eventually this vision actually was fulfilled in a way, um, but not uh, with the exact, not, not of course with this precise vision. Now, um, I just want to put this in a little bit broader context. Um, uh, McEnany uh, uh, and, and, and his fellow uh, office holders saw the Civic Center as part of a broader reform that would transform the entire city. Um, the most urgent problem that they saw was the need, was, was sort of a contradictory need, actually. They wanted to decongest the center of the city, which was very congested with tenements, which had hall office buildings that were going up um, 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 one, one next to another, each way one taller than the last one. Um, yet at the same time, they wanted to maintain the property values of the central city, and they wanted to maintain the center as, as the center of, of civic life and of business. Um, the, at the same time, they wanted to move the population out into the outer boroughs, but they needed to do it in a way that um, was going to be economical for developers to, and, and at densities high enough that the, the developers would be willing to build um, in, in, the outer, in, in the outer boroughs. So um, uh, George McEnany was very committed to the ideal of city planning. He said that city planning is the firm base for a, the building of a healthy and happy community. And again, land values, he said, it's also a means of increasing and spreading that constantly increasing ratio of our taxable values, um, which is essential for any city to keep running. So uh, uh, they, uh, so McEnany led the city in, uh, in, in negotiations with the Interborough Rapid Transit Company and the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, later the BMT, to build a network of new subway lines like this one, um, the, which eventually became the number seven line, going out to Corona and then later Flushing. Uh, that would, move, that would, that would uh, uh, serve undeveloped land, um, which the subway companies did not want to serve because nobody was going to ride it until the, the development came there. Um, but, but McEnany got them to agree to do this um, because it, and also gave them permission to build new lines in Manhattan and uh, uh, ensured that, the, and, and also wrote into the agreements that the fare had to remain at five cents so that people could afford to ride it. Um, and. Uh, at the same time, McEnany spearheaded a, uh, uh, a comprehensive zoning plan for the city. The first zoning that New York City ever had, one of the first zoning uh, uh, laws that, of any city in the United States that would ensure that when these new subway lines 
were extended out to these new neighborhoods, that they were going to be stable, that areas that were designated for residences would stay residences, that industrial areas would be concentrated in places like waterfronts and along rail lines and in low-lying areas, that commercial businesses would be restricted to uh, designated streets. So rather than re reduplicating the old pattern of, of the central city where everything's kind of mixed together and it's very dense, you're going to ensure that things are more spread out. Um, and you're going to, and, and, and it enabled the creation of new neighborhoods like, like the garden apartments of Jackson Heights, um, for example, uh, as shown here. Um, so uh, 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 at the same time, it was going to sculpt the skyline of the, center, of the central city to ensure that the business districts, um, as skyscrapers were built, that they would not impinge on each other's light and air, that they would have to step back from the, from the, from the edges of the streets as they, went, as they got higher, like the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building, um, which you can see here, and uh, that as, as, these, uh, as, as the area uh, developed, with, developed, it would be livable and also continue to be financially feasible, um, and that these buildings would hold their real estate value. So, so this planning, so, so, so this plan overall, when you consider the zoning, the subways, and, and even the civic center together, was really, really a, a, a transformational for the city. It really created um, the, 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 the modern city that we live in today. And, and, and the more I look at it, the more I think that it was really the most um, uh, uh, far-reaching and influential of the periods of city planning that, that New York City has had, um, and, and, and probably deserves more uh, uh, public awareness than, 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 it, than it really has now. Um, now, uh, now, what happened to George McEnany? So, uh, so McEnany uh, ran again for office in 1913 uh, to, uh, again, as a f on the fusion slate to, uh, for president of the Board of Aldermen, which is now a position that's now known as the public advocate. And so he was uh, a, a vice mayor basically, um, and he had some moments of glory as an acting mayor. Here he is with, with President Woodrow Wilson. Um, in the 1920s, he became chairman of the State Transit Commission, um, which was overseeing all of the new transit lines that were being built in the city. In the 1930s, uh, he became president of the Regional Plan Association, which was uh, an organization that, of course, still exists to try to promote planning throughout not only New York City, but also uh, uh, the suburbs of New York, Long Island, Connecticut and New Jersey, um, during this decade they were especially concerned with trying to get all of those surrounding municipalities, towns, uh, boroughs, and villages to adopt planning and zoning laws. And they did so. They were successful. Um, and so uh, 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 the fact that this region is now completely planned and zoned uh, is, is, is partly uh, attributable to, to the efforts of George McEnany and others at, at, at the RPA in, uh, in, in the 1930s. Um, he also became involved in historic preservation during his time at the RPA. Uh, here he is uh, in, uh, on April 30th, 1939, on the foot of, at the foot of Federal Hall National Memorial, um, proclaiming it as a national memorial. Uh, this was the 150th anniversary of George Washington's inaugural, when, when Washington spoke it from the same location. 150 years later, McEnany speaking. And he's, he's, uh, he's reading a speech written by Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior, proclaiming this as a, as a national historic site. And as far as I've been able to tell, this was the first historic building ever designated as a national historic site in any major American city. Um, before the 1930s, the federal government wasn't really in that business, apart from things like battlefields and the Statue of Liberty. Um, uh, so McEnany also started a museum inside Federal Hall during the 1940s. And um, here he is uh, uh, as part of a publicity stunt. This was sort of a, a, a center of patriotism during that time, um, buying war bonds from, Hel from the actress Helen Hayes. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and throughout the war and also for in the few, uh, few years after the war, he was engaged in a battle over another historic site at the southern, at the southern tip of Manhattan, Castle Clinton, which is, of course, the fort in Battery Park. Um, that Robert Moses wanted to demolish first for a bridge, then when he couldn't build the bridge, um, he wanted to demolish it supposedly because it was blocking the sight lines to the Statue of Liberty. And so um, uh, uh, George McEnany was the leader of the fight to, to try to, uh, to, to, to prevent that fort from being demolished. Um, and, and this had come out of his work with the Regional Plan Association originally actually in trying to convince Moses that there were, that there were good alternatives to, to building that bridge over to Brooklyn. Um, 
and of course a tunnel ended up being built instead. Um, so then, uh, by this point, George McEnany is a, uh, a national figure in historic preservation. Um, and and here, he, here he is in this um, photograph with, uh, uh, on uh, the steps of a building in Washington, D.C. with a number of other uh, 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 preservation leaders from throughout the United States. They are forming, uh, here in 1948, the National Council of Historic Sites and Buildings which is going to create an organization called the National Trust for Historic Preservation. George McEnany is the chairman of this group. And, and the National Trust, of course, has become the pre preeminent um, historic preservation advocacy group in the United States and also uh, manages and owns a number of historic sites itself. Uh, so, uh, so, so George McEnany uh, had, had, had moved sort of from, in, in, some, in some respects, from being a, a, a builder to a preserver um, but uh, uh, I think that, 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 that throughout his career, we see a, a sense of compromise and a sense of, of, of working with others um, to, to try to achieve, uh, achieve things for the city. Um, so during his life, uh, McEnany was known for, um, he, was, he was known and remembered for these things. Um, this was published in 1947, a, a caricature of McEnany remembering that 25 years before he'd been the, the chairman of the, of, the, of the Transit Commission. Um, he was known as someone who, who uh, solved the subway problem, who got the subways built, who planned uh, the, the shape of Greater New York, and who uh, then uh, became a, 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 a historic preservationist. Um, and when he died in 1953, a couple of years later, this plaque was designated in, uh, was, uh, was dedicated in Federal Hall to his memory. Um, uh, that he was a pioneer of city planning, a pr protector of historic places, leader of a city, and a friend beyond compare. Um, and actually, this is his wife, uh, his widow, uh, Marjorie McEnany, um, and his granddaughter, Kay, who is in the audience tonight, actually, um, <laughs> uh, 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 who is who, un unveiling, unveiling the plaque. Um, <clears throat> So uh, unfortunately, though, in, since then, uh, uh, since that time, his role, and in fact, much of the story about how the city was shaped before World War II um, has been not forgotten by scholars necessarily, but, necessarily but, but it slipped from general public knowledge. And now when we think of historic planning in New York, we mostly just think of Robert Moses, who came along um, after this. But, uh, 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 but now, you know, we're, we're in a new century where we're facing a lot of, of new challenges and the city is going to need to be reshaped in the future. Um, and so uh, perhaps it's time to, to renew the city's consciousness of, of its shaping in the past and who, 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 who did that and, and how they did it and what their, uh, what their objectives were. Um, and so um, I hope that, that we tonight have, have provided some insight um, for all of you into, into that. So thank you, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you.